And again, so this kind of shows a couple of things. One, how POD works, but also that it doesn't necessarily give us a decomposition which is most obvious or that isolates separate dynamical features. And I want to come back to that later on <clears throat> and talk about variants that do do exactly that. But before I get there, there's a few other properties that, that I want to look at. Um, so this is basically what I said before. Uh, the leading two modes capture all the energy of the data, but they don't partition the different time scales that are present in the data. And one way to see why this, well, why this occurs or why it's reasonable that this occurs is that the POB modes themselves would be the same uh, if we completely rearranged our data in time. So the identification of the basis for our spatial modes doesn't have anything to do with the temporal dynamics. And again, that's sort of a function of uh, how we're arranging and decomposing our data, <clears throat> which is good in a way, because if we don't have time-resolved data or we don't have any temporal information, we can at least get spatial modes without needing that temporal information. But it's bad because we're not accounting for that in, the, in building up our basis. So again, I'm going to come back to this point, but to get there, there are a few other properties uh, of the SVD and thus the POD that I want to talk about. The first is the relationship between the singular value decomposition and the eigen decomposition of these Hermitian matrices that are obtained by taking our data matrix and multiplying it with, a, with its adjoint. Um, so what that allows us to do is to compute either the left or the right singular vectors by uh, using an eigen problem. <clears throat> but what, what physically that means for our data is that these y star y, for example, um, is a matrix of all of the inner products or correlations between uh, different snapshots in time. <clears throat> uh, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm building up perhaps a slightly different perspective as to what the S, what POD is giving us. <clears throat> uh, and similarly, in sorry, similarly in space, one can also take in a product in, in space. So that would be, <clears throat> sorry, take inner products of measurements at different locations in time and form a correlation matrix that way and obtain, uh, to obtain the, the, P, the spatial POD modes through an eigen decomposition. And one consequence of this is because our data matrix Y is typically rectangular, then one of these two matrices is going to be sig potentially significantly smaller than the other, which can actually give you a computationally cheaper way to compute your SVD or, or compute your POD decomposition, which is sort of uh, where the method of snapshots comes from in, in fluids. <clears throat> but moreover, you can do an eigen decomposition of one of these guys and then recover your other singular vectors relatively easily through these properties that relate the left and the right singular vectors. And again, I'm, I'm putting these uh, properties of the SVD and thus POD up, uh, both for interest, but also because it's going to be relevant to what I want to talk about next. <clears throat> but one thing to note is that even though this can be a way to compute the SVD, that's not typically what goes on under the hood uh, in Python or MATLAB or whatever, um, because it's not the most uh, accurate or, or, uh, method to compute it. But that's more of an aside here. Anyway, so as well as thinking about uh, POD modes as the left singular vectors of the data matrix, we can also think about them as the eigenvectors of a 
of a correlation matrix and similar to, for the POD mode coefficients. So where am I going with this? Well, really, when we're computing these inner products, so to get terms uh, in those Hermitian matrices, Y star Y or Y Y star, we're computing these inner products, but really more generally, what we're trying to do is approximate, particularly if we have, say, an underlying system which is continuous in space and time, and maybe we're only, or probably we're only sampling uh, at a finite number of points, is that we're trying to approximate these integrals. <coughs> so that is, if we take the inner product between two snapshots in space, really what we're trying to do is approximate this integral, which is uh, the integral over the full spatial domain. And similarly in time. So one thing to note here is that depending on how we're sampling in space or even in time, we might actually want to adjust uh, how we compute the inner product between uh, our discretely sampled data to better approximate these integrals. So most typically if we're, uh, if our spatial domain or if our data say comes from a fluid simulation and we have higher spatial resolution in areas that have larger local gradients, local velocity gradients, then we probably have, um, <clears throat> then we have more data, comparatively more data there than everywhere else. So we need to kind of de-weight uh, the contribution of those data points in order for our results to be consistent with what we're trying to approximate here. Or in other words, for the output of our, of our POD algorithm to be as independent as possible from uh, the discretely sampled points that we have in space and time. <clears throat> and I, in the associated notes, I go through in a bit more detail how, how this is done in practice. And again, I wanted to point this out because a lot of times some of these things are kind of skipped over when you read about these things in the literature. But the other reason why I wanted to talk about this relationship to what's going on in the continuous setting is because <clears throat> if we wanted to, uh, as well as defining the inner products that way, we can also ask, well, what is the equivalent eigenproblem that we're trying to solve to give our POD modes, say, <clears throat> or POD mode coefficients, if we forget about the data, but just looking at, look at the underlying continuous function. And so what we're really doing <clears throat> is we're solving this uh, integral problem where we're trying to find, <clears throat> find our uh, spatial modes that, that satisfy this, where this C uh, tensor is the spatial correlation function. And again, that's what we're trying to approximate or uh, modulo a, a factor of the number of snapshots that we have. Um, that's the expected value of uh, our measurements at one point in space and our measurements in it at a different point in space across all time or all realizations. But having said that, that kind of potentially introduces another way uh, or a related problem that we can think about. And that is, if we're going to compute this spatial correlation function, or we could also do one in time as well if we wanted to, why not put everything together? So say, well, really, we have a function of space and time, so why not form a correlation tensor that includes sort of all differences in both space and time? And that leads to this eigenproblem. <clears throat> And again, there's going to be a reason why I'm, I'm talking about this, and it's going to get come back to uh, a potential downside of POD that, that came up before, which is that it didn't break apart our different uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, frequency components in our underlying signal. <clears throat> 
So again, I'm doing nothing more than, than sort of generalizing this eigen problem and letting time be something that's included in this correlation function. And, and the best way to sort of think about this is rather than just having perhaps one series of time, having multiple realizations of the same system for different times or for different gaps in time in order to build up this correlation function. So really we're perhaps thinking about this not as an entirely deterministic system, but as a, as a stochastic system that we can obtain statistics for. So where are we going with this? Well, <clears throat> we also have a property, and I'm not going to show it here, that <clears throat> if we have uh, directions in either space or time under which our system is invariant, so that is, if our system is expected to look the same at time one or time two without knowing any, any other information. So for example, if we're looking at you know, turbulent pipe flow or something like that, then the POD ha uh, has to reduce to a Fourier transform in this direction. So again, perhaps if you were looking at turbulent flow through a pipe uh, and you wanted to take the POD of it, you actually have if the pipe is infinite length and uh, or, or periodic, uh, and you have azimuthal symmetry, then you get POD modes in uh, the directions of spatial symmetry. So in the streamwise and azimuthal direction. Um, and also, if we're looking at this sort of more generalized space-time version of POD, then we also are expected to have uh, Fourier transform in that direction as well. So what that means in the case where we have <clears throat> um, invariance under translations in time is that this problem can actually be written in the frequency domain uh, where each of our Fourier transformed modes are a function not just of space but also of frequency. And so this actually gives us our frequency decomposition. And so just to say a few more words uh, about how we compute this in practice, one typically does, can perform a windowed Fourier transform or to take uh, a whole bunch of Fourier transforms of data and then sort of do a separate POD in each frequency band. And this, uh, <clears throat> So this paper by Town et al. goes through a lot of those details or introduces a lot of um, the methods about how one can do this. But I wanted to also hear, uh, not yet, say a little bit more about the history, uh, which is that sort of this initial space-time version of POD is actually kind of included in the original formulation of POD by, uh, by Lumley, uh, but kind of wasn't fully utilized and still isn't used all that often, uh, both due to the, diff at least from what I can tell, due to the uh, comparative difficulty in actually computing it, <clears throat> and also because it's less amenable to some of the methods or some of the things that you want to do with POD modes. So uh, most uh, sort of typically uh, projecting uh, the governing equations onto some re reduced subspace <clears throat> as Professor Nowak was talking about uh, in the first lecture today. But again, as I mentioned before, we now have more time resolved data, we have bigger computers, uh, and so it's, it's possible to go back and get this sort of spectral or space-time version uh, computed in practice, which, as I mentioned before, is meant to, or, or can in theory, separate out your different time scales. And I, I want to mention this at some point, uh, but so I don't forget, uh, the next lecture is uh, by Professor Schmidt is going to be talking about a different way to kind of uh, identify... Uh, structures within your system that uh, are each, correspond, each correspond to uh, specific uh, timescales or frequency components or, uh, <clears throat> or eigenvalues, basically. So now, before I go to this, 
what I wanted to do is to go back to our original data and to look at what happens if we do this spectral version of POD. Now here, I'm kind of cheating because our, our data is entirely deterministic. Um, we really only need to do a Fourier transform in time, uh, <clears throat> and then our Fourier modes will be our POD modes. In general, as I mentioned before, if we have a system that is uh, stochastic, then really what we want to do is build up the statistics of Fourier transforms of uh, finite length da data samples and proceed from there. But for here, it's sort of sufficient to take a Fourier transform. <clears throat> so what I'm doing here is uh, taking the Fourier transform of, of each row of Y. So that corresponds to the, the Fourier transform of the signal at each spatial location. And then what I can do is look at what my spectral content looks like if I were to plot it. And so what we see here is perhaps what would be expected. So this is space and this is frequency. And we see that we sort of have these two blobs, each of which corresponds to uh, what's well, very one frequency or a very small frequency band, and then a given region in space. And this is, again, consistent with how we defined our original function, because we defined these two Gaussians uh, that had different widths and different, uh, that were centered at different spatial locations. And actually, these frequencies of about 1.3 and 4.1 uh, were exactly what we defined as well. So what do our uh, sort of spectral POD modes look like? which is essentially our Fourier modes, well, we get back what we had originally, which is unsurprising um, because, <clears throat> well, we knew what the data was when we put it in, uh, and actually these are the frequencies that we found to correspond to these, uh, well, they're sort of the nearest frequencies to the frequencies that I, that I put in. A few things to note here, though, is that this is actually requires... Uh, was more restrictive in terms of what the, pro what the temporal properties of your data are. So in order to compute this Fourier transform relatively accurately, uh, we, we need to have sufficient temporal resolution and, <clears throat> and also enough data. So if I were to go back and let's suppose make this... Uh, let's say dt is 0.1 and let's say... I only have 100 samples, then, okay, I can run through things. I can plot this, don't need to plot that. I can compute my SVD again. Singular values look about the same. Modes, yeah, look about the same, modulo or plus or minus. Uh, mode coefficients, well, they're more discretized in, in time now, but they're basically the same. But my spectral POD, I'm going to guess we start to get um, more sort of spread due to the fact that we have a, a, a limited resolution in, in frequency space. And actually, this still looks okay, but we're starting to get... Well, actually, we can start to see that uh, the relative size of these guys is kind of... Um, has been affected by the, the quality of our data. And there's a few kinks in it, too. And if we had even less time resolution to our data, or even fewer snapshots, then we, we run into the limits of what we're going to be, identify, be able to identify, at least with this method. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if that would... Um, one thing that I will add here. Okay, there we've got, I've broken it. Um, uh, and again, I, I think that's because I'm, the frequency that I chose is, uh, <clears throat> or the, the time set that I too, chose was too large to be able to resolve uh, the frequency of this other mode. Um, even though we, we kind of get where it's located, 
reasonably well here, but the mode itself is, is so small. So anyway, there are more restrictions. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But so basically, um, unless I tried to break it, we can actually recover here the um, frequency localized modes corresponding to uh, the full data. So I'd shown this slide previously. Uh, this was sort of the time where I kind of wanted to go through some of the history, though I'm, I'm obviously skipping over a, a lot here. But the other thing, well, one other thing that I wanted to add is that there are a lot of other variants and formulations of POD, only a few of which I'm, I'm putting here. Um, but, but the point that I wanted to make is that if you wanted to do something very specific with your data, or if you, your data has a certain, uh, certain properties, that it's possible, then it is possible then that the sort of straight out of the box uh, POD just using the SVD might not necessarily be the best uh, or optimal thing to choose. Um, <clears throat> so for example, uh, as I mentioned before, if you had data missing, you can potentially recover that using uh, gappy POD type methods, and there's been many other works aside from this. Uh, you can, there are other ways to try to seek uh, separation of scales uh, in, in space. Um, you can, there are methods that can, uh, that are more robust to, to noisy data. And it's also possible to adapt POD methods to optimize something other than just the, the total kinetic energy of the data. So for example, if we look at ideas rel related to balanced truncation or balanced proper orthogonal decomposition, uh, you can actually just change uh, the inner product weighting matrices or change the inner products that you're using in order to give uh, a decomposition that best uh, balances controllability and observability of an underlying linear dynamical system. Uh, so the point that I'm making here is that there are a, sort of a, a bunch of variants. And one, uh, so one actually aside that I wanted to, to talk about uh, if I had time, and I think I had time. So, I, uh, so, so next lecture, uh, Peter Schmidt is going to be talking about the dynamic mode decomposition. And I want to leave you with sort of a, a conundrum here, which is actually, if I try to take DMD of this data set, and I, I don't want to try to, to, to sort of jump on this too much, so, um, but it turns out it actually doesn't work. I get eigenvalues that are real when I, I should get oscillating components. Um, and there's a good reason for this, but I'm not going to tell you. But uh, if you have a conjecture, then feel free to come and uh, tell me later. And actually, and to show that I'm not just cheating because of my time resolution, let's go back to the full. And again, if you, haven't, if you don't know about dynamic mode decomposition, then perhaps keep this in your mind until after the next lecture and see if you can understand why DMD gives nonsense eigenvalues uh, when given this data set. So are there any questions at this point? Yes. <laughs> Where do you see the niche applications of the space-time POD? I mean, there's a beauty uh, uh, about them. Yeah. But, uh, do, do you think they can actually help for dynamic modeling, for control, for anything we are normally doing? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So. Um, most of the work with space-time POD up until this point has sort of been in the, the spectral version, so when you have uh, temporal inhomogeneity. So one could argue that one aspect of it is that if you just want to perform uh, 
some modal decomposition to obtain insight as to what the isolated dynamical features in your system are, then perhaps the spectral POD will help there. In terms of trying to use it for, say, reduced order modeling methods, it's unclear, at least generally, whether you expect it to perform better or worse than just a, a standard POD. Um, I think that also, though, in problems where you're particularly interested in what's going on at a, at a particular time scale, so perhaps due to the phenomena that you've identified, say, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of speculating here, uh, it's possible that being able to zone in on or zoom in on the dynamics related to that, so that could be the frequency that you're interested in plus harmonics that are going to feed into that frequency via the, the nonlinear term in the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, I mean, it's possible that one could think about that subsystem with everything else being like an external forcing in order to potentially uh, say something about its dynamics and how it can be controlled. The other aspect that I wanted to, to say there is, so let's say more generally, we don't have a system which is uh, invariant under time translation. So let's say maybe we're looking at uh, the response to some actuation for our system, but we're starting at a bunch of initial, different initial conditions. Then it's feasible that one could do a sort of space-time POD to uh, come up with sort of the most uh, important uh, modes of response of your system that might then you, be. Then you would also have to ensemble average in addition. On so, yes, 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 yes. So we're assuming that we do the same experiment many times, starting at different mm -hmm. initial conditions and build up statistics that way. Um, perhaps that would be useful for, uh, for some things, or one could further decompose your space-time modes, which themselves would be trajectories. But I haven't tried it out, so I'm only conjecturing here. Um, but really, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. And you might have other insights that you can tell me about later. <clears throat> uh, are there any other questions or thoughts? Okay. So. The only other thing that I wanted to, so that, that basically concludes the material that I, uh, that I had for this lecture. Um, but since, since this is a machine learning lecture series, I thought I'd more explicitly uh, show something related to machine learning, um, <laughs> which is this XKCD comic. Uh, and I want to use, I want to make a few points here. The first is not that I, I don't want to put this up as a critis, critique of machine learning, but rather to say that I think that it's important to understand uh, the properties of sort of the, the fundamental linear algebra tools and operations, and indeed ways in which they can be improved in order to know how to best uh, design your perhaps more complex machine learning method that uh, ends up you know, giving, giving you something useful in the end. <clears throat> Uh, and really, you know, as was mentioned earlier, perhaps the, the SVD or the POD can be thought of as the most simple type of autoencoder that one can do to, to data. Uh, so this is perhaps a, a perspective that uh, is maybe useful to think about when we're, we're going through some of these lectures on the more sort of fundamental concepts, is that it's all uh, sort of building blocks uh, that gives you a set of tools with, with, with which one can uh, combine in the right way or, or, or get a computer to combine in the right way to give you something useful. Um, so with that, uh, I'm happy to take any more questions if anyone has, it, has them, uh, but thank you all for your attention. <laughs>